Um, my name is Joshua Eisenman. I'm an assistant professor here at the Elliott uh, Elli School. Hello. No, I went to the Elliott School, that's why I said it. At the LBJ School here, um, and a distinguished fellow at the Strauss Center, and I coordinate the Understanding China Initiative, which is uh, uh, kind of the auspices to which this conference is being held. Um, I want to thank uh, Ali Prince, uh, who uh, many of you know. I think we should all give her a round of applause. She did a great job organizing. Um, and uh, the Strauss Center uh, crew who has helped to put together this event. Um, we've got excellent uh, uh, presenters from around the country, from top universities. Um, and so maybe I would just kick us off with a couple of opening remarks before I turn it over to our first panelist, who will be uh, Mark Blecker. Um, so as many of you know, if you've been reading the news, around China, uh, there are celebrations going on about reform and opening up, uh, whether it be at, ex there are exhibits uh, in political uh, arenas and museums, and orchestras are playing, uh, uh, universities are holding events, um, but why? What is reform and opening up? I mean, certainly it's not the kind of anniversary, like a birthday, it's not a kind of a one day thing, this is the anniversary. Um, but, but some way it's being treated that way. Um, and so today we're going to open up this question of reform and opening up. We're going to look at the legacies and lessons of reform and opening up, both for China and for other countries that are interested in looking at replicating China's rapid economic growth. And so these are among the questions we're going to be discussing here today. But our aim is to get beyond economics alone. Um, economics has dominated the conversation, especially if you're in China dealing with these issues. The economic piece is the largest piece. But uh, there are important political and security related transitions, uh, foreign policy transitions that have also been underway over this 40 year period. So we're going to take a broader and deeper look here today. Um, just to give you a kind of once over lightly, over the last 40 years we have seen the downfall of Jiang Qing and the radicals the Hua Guofeng Deng Xiaoping power struggle, the emergence of Deng Xiaoping, the Tiananmen Square crackdown, and the party purges of liberals that followed. We've seen creeping authoritarianism, creeping kleptocracy under Jiang Zemin, the emergence of the Youth League faction or Tuan Pai under uh, uh, Hu Jintao. And all of this is then prelude to the context which is Xi Jinping's massive purge of the party ranks over the last few years. Um, uh, something that is on a scale greater than the Cultural Revolution if we're looking at the total amount of people who have lost their jobs and been uh, put in jail. Um, <clears throat> so this, we can be tempted to say, well, this is just another Chinese power consolidation. Um, this is no different than what we've seen before. This is a strong man bringing uh, uh, together uh, a party which was fraction, uh, fractious. Um, and I think that we see this often on the covers of magazines as well. We'll see Xi Jinping depicted in Mao's clothing or his face put on top of Mao or Mao's hair with Xi's face. These kinds of images which suggest that, Mao, that Xi Jinping is nothing more than the newest Mao Zedong. And I think that that is an oversimplification and I think it's something we, we should be able to get into today and, and, and discuss a little bit. Just to put out five things that are different and really importantly different than what we've seen before. That um, I hope we can get into today. Um, the first and maybe the most important on the economic front is the fraying of what I like to call a shorthand, the Deng Xiaoping deal. Um, the idea that we are going to drive economic growth, we're going to make your life better, we're going to increase consumption, and you are going to allow the party to have full reign over the political arena. Uh, we all know the Chinese economy is suffering some uh, uh, bumps in the road. I think Professor Pally will talk a bit about that in particular. Um, but what does that mean then for the political side of this arrangement? Um, is that thrown into some tension? Um, we are certainly living in a time when the security state um, and the tools at its disposal are far in excess of anything we've ever seen in the past, and maybe in excess of anything we even thought of a decade ago. Um, here I'm talking about supercomputing, cloud computing, facial recognition, a variety of different technologies which are fundamentally different and that Mao Zedong could have never dreamed of in his attempts uh, to control China. Uh, more broadly, China is a rich and strong country now, and in my life that hasn't really been the case. Um, China had been a developing country and a backward country, and it's rich and strong now, and increasingly bold in its foreign policy. Um, the days of biding time and hiding capabilities are over. China has, as we talked about a few months ago, China stepped out. China is um, the number two economy in the world, 
um, and um, the decisions and the fate of China lie only really in the hands of Chinese people. And that may be the first time in 200 years where foreign powers aren't able to dictate to China its future. Now, we could talk about which Chinese people. It's certainly not every Chinese person. It is a selectorate of Chinese people, but they are Chinese nonetheless. Um, and then finally, I would say Xi Jinping, all due respect, is no Mao Zedong. Um, he's not politically Maoist, because I would doubt his credentials as a communist. Um, he uses Maoist tactics, to be sure. And I would say one example is this um, social credit score, which remind me a lot of the work point system in the commune. We can talk a bit about that during the break and this connections there. But I would say, and I, I think it's hard to dispute, that he lacks Mao Zedong's experience, both on the battlefield and the political arena. Um, and he lacks the aura of Mao Zedong. I mean, put quite frankly, Xi Jinping is immortal. He's like us. He's a human being. Mao Zedong was in a place, a position of his own. And so I think these connections we are making, particularly in the West, between Xi and Mao, are a bit overblown. So, but I want to put that out there uh, for debate. Uh, others may feel differently. Um, so to wrap up there, um, the discussion here today is not only the past, but wither reform in China. Uh, where is it going? And more broadly, at a time when China is suggesting that it has lessons to share the world. This was a point Xi Jinping made at the 19th Party Congress, that China has development lessons and that it can share these lessons with the world. Um, it sees itself as the natural leader of developing countries. Um, again, akin somewhat to the Mao Zedong third world approach um, that uh, had been in the 1960s and 70s. Um, so another question is, what are the lessons then, if any, that developing countries can take from China's experience? Not only what does China's experience mean for China, but what does it mean for others, both good and bad? Um, and so to answer these questions, which I think about quite a lot in my office upstairs, um, we've invited a, an august group of top scholars from around the United States. Um, so uh, you all have in your packets, or uh, over here on the table, the bios uh, of the folks who are going to be talking. But uh, maybe I'll just go through them very briefly. Uh, to my left is uh, uh, Mark Blecker, the James Monroe Professor of Politics and East Asian Studies at Oberlin College. Um, he's been uh, working on China for, well, I could say this about everybody. So everybody here has been working on China for decades. So <laughs> just put that out there. Um, and maybe I'll just go down the list here. In front of me is uh, Professor Chen Wenhong. Uh, she's an associate professor here at UT in the media and sociology. Um, and uh, then me, who you know, uh, James Goldbreth, uh, who's uh, not here, uh, but will be here later, uh, an, an economist and professor here at the LBJ School. Uh, Rana Imboden, uh, sitting in front of me. Uh, Rana is an associate at the Strauss Center and a professor here at the LBJ School. And she's a China expert, and she works on human rights and other issues. Right on time, Professor Jamie Goldbreth. Um, uh, uh, sitting uh, to my left here, Professor Li Hua Yin, who's a professor in the history department. Uh, James Mann, uh, a senior journalist who's written a variety of books on China. Uh, Tom Pally, an economist uh, uh, at the US-China Commission, my former colleague. Uh, Jagannath Sarankin, who is, is not here but works on Asia security related issues. Uh, professor Andrew Scobell uh, from the RAND Corporation. Uh, who is an expert on Chinese military and security issues as well as foreign policy, and Professor Solinger, uh, Doris Solinger, who should be here momentarily, who is a professor of emerita at uh, the University of California, Irvine. So we've got, uh, oh yeah, of course, I don't want to forget the last page. Uh, uh, professor Bradley Womack, uh, the Yen Chair Professor of Foreign Affairs at the University of Virginia, um, and uh, Isabella Weber, a lecturer in economics, who's flown in all the way from London who wins the uh, best traveler or the longest traveler award. So uh, with that introduction, I just want to turn uh, the floor over to uh, Mark Blecker and uh, have him get us started. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for having me. I, don't, I only have one slide, but, but I need it. Oh, there it is. OK, good. Good. Um, I can just pick it up there. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, I'm lucky to go first because people are still awake. Um, but I'll do my best to uh, make it harder for, for you, to make it harder for people to follow. Um, we're going to talk about labor. Uh, I'm not sure why we would start there, but I'm happy about that. Um, in, um, in the wake of the political crisis of the Cultural Revolution, um, China's 
post-Mao leadership, undertook not just reforms, because um, I don't like the word reform. It, to me, it connotes a gradual process of tinkering around the edges. And so I insist um, that uh, my students uh, say more of a mouthful and call it structural reform, uh, because what's happened in China, as we all know, has amounted to uh, a social and economic revolution, really, uh, albeit one led from above by the self-same Green Communist Party. Uh, this is a project that um, Antonio Gramsci would have called a passive revolution. Uh, the party did this in order to preserve its uh, party state itself and the state that it um, also founded by refounding its legitimacy on the basis of economic growth and improved living standards, you all know this. Um, this strategy worked. Where in the Mao period, genuine working class political radicalism actually attacked the way the party state ruled and even the rightfulness of its claim to power. Um, in the Cultural Revolution, uh, well, not just the Cultural Revolution, in the Maoist period, actually, from the very beginning, through the Cultural Revolution, workers were actually attacking the legitimacy of the um, Chinese state. Um, workers in the early 1950s made fun of the party and made fun of Mao and uh, called the, the, the hats that the party wore with the red stars, they called them Taxica, which was Texaco. Um, and they uh, said the rudest things about Mao and the party. Um, and then in the Cultural Revolution, of course, there were major attacks on the rightfulness of the party to rule, um, or at least the party uh, as constituted at that time. Um, so where in the, Ma in the Maoist period, genuine working class radicalism actually came close to attacking the legitimacy of the state, um, under structural reform, proletarian politics has become depoliticized. Um, it has focused on usually uh, owners, usually private owners and managers, rather than the state. Uh, it has gone for bread and butter issues, and it certainly has not argued that the Communist Party or the People's Republic <coughs> ought to rule. Indeed, workers often seek the help of the party state in order to deal with their, uh, uh, with their management, where, with whom workers have gripes. Um, so the strategy worked. It's happened uh, thanks to economic and social structural factors, among others. Economically, workers' wages and livelihoods improved absolutely, as you can see, uh, while declining relatively and becoming much more unevenly distributed. Socially, the working class has fragmented, which undermined its political capacity. To, uh, to act on its own behalf. Recently, though, the foundations of the party state's legitimacy among workers have eroded. These two foundations have eroded. Workers' economic status has begun to stagnate or fall, while socially the working class has become more homogeneous. That's one of the bigger points I want to make this morning. Um, the political implications of these two changes, uh, the economic slowdown, um, relative decline and increasing homogeneity of the working class uh, could have profound political implications. Um, wages and hours. Um, under structural reform, that's this, uh, um, real wages rose at an average annual rate of 13% between 1978 <coughs> and uh, 2015. Real wages. During the crucial early years, when industrial labor began to become commodified and subject to layoffs, um, so we're talking about the uh, uh, late 80s and into the uh, mid 90s, 57% um, of workers responding to a trade union survey in 1997 said that their incomes had risen in recent years. But the increases have been distributed very unevenly over time and space. Real rises in the 4 to 8% range through 1999 um, 
were very significant compared with the overall wage stagnation of the Maoist decades. Wage increases in the 10 to annual real wage increases in the 10 to 15 percent rate range in the first decade of the new century. A big spike you can see in the middle. Um, were truly extraordinary. Um, but as you can also see, the rate of increase has been slowing significantly since 2009, um, although I think it's fair to argue that um, 8% increases are uh, still pretty healthy. Uh, thanks. I think I'm done. Uh, point, well, I'll keep it. I'm point at you. Um, thanks, man. No, it's a laser um, Okay. Let's look at the actual wages that these data are measuring, which is, after all, what workers do. They don't look at things like this, they look at their wages. Uh, for rural migrants toiling away in sweatshops, uh, making devices like this that we're all using, um, wages can run to as little as a few dollars a day still. Often workers are not even told what the wage is at the time they're hired, and they are never sure what to expect in their pay package. They are subject to various deductions for dormitory and hiring fees from the factory, from intermediaries, uh, or both. They're also subject to all manner of fines for infractions of elaborate draconian labor rules. Then there are the fees and deposits that are charged just to get a job, which can run as high as 6,000 yuan. People pay to get a job. Uh, incredibly, three quarters of rural migrant workers have experienced wage arrears in payment of even these paltry <coughs> wages. Already in 1997, over 11 million migrant and urban resident workers, I'm making a distinction that we all know between rural migrants, Nun uh, Yahuko uh, and Fe uh, Nun um, But already in 1997, over 11 million of both nationally were subject to wage arrears averaging 1,900 yuan per worker. In January 2015, two protests against wage arrears, which had ballooned in these egregious cases over years and years, to the point where workers were owed 900,000 yuan per worker, uh, resulted in two deaths. One effect, probably intentional, of wage arrears, of course, is to, is to discourage workers from quitting when conditions become unbearable. Um, and this also works. Um, it gets worse. Uh, pushing wages to their lowest limit of zero. Um, slavery has returned to China under the structural reforms. And it has even been reported in Chinese newspapers from the early 1990s up till 2016, when over 3 million Chinese were estimated to be enslaved. I think we don't think about this very much. Um, in 2017, university students were assigned to forced labor in Foxconn factories to gain, quote, work experience unrelated to their studies. It's not exactly slavery, but it certainly is forced labor. Um, overtime in violation of China's own labor legislation has been endemic at the turn of the century. 80% of Chinese workers put in at least 10 hours a day. Uh, the legal limit is eight. Uh, nearly half reported regular seven-day weeks. Uh, and around a dozen were reported to have died of overwork, and many thousands suffered serious life-changing injuries. Uh, in 2009, 41% of workers worked overtime, much of it presumably forced, and 29% were not paid for it. Um, so these are some of the kinds of conditions, that, uh, wages and hours that workers are working under. Um, my colleague, Dory Salinger, uh, has written a very important article that concluded that it's impossible to arrive at a defensible figure for unemployment. So I'm switching, sorry switching from wages and hours to unemployment and labor insecurity. Dory, Dory has shown that it's impossible to, to measure Chinese unemployment, a uh, position which she found agreement from <coughs> no less a source than the People's Daily, oh. who uh, agreed with her, although, although not by name. Oh. But they also said 
can measure this. Um, but it surely runs into the tens of millions. Um, even according to official statistics, which do not count workers who are, quote, laid off, uh, unquote, for three years, uh, unemployment nearly doubled from 1990 to 2015. This was due heavily to the 1997 decision to privatize or close many state-owned enterprises. Around the turn of the century, the number of laid-off workers increased over tenfold to 21 million at a time when official unemployment statistics had the number at around 7 million. Um, while those living in cities where there is ready employment for their children are often able to get by, the situation in Rust <coughs> Belt areas has been dire since the late 1990s. In Liaoning Province, uh, in Dongbei, in the Northeast, um, employment in manufacturing dropped from 4.6 million in 1990 to 1.5 million in 2004, and the number of workers registered as unemployed, registered as unemployed, most of course do not register, or are not registered by the government. Um, um, yeah, unemployment doubled from 237,000 in 1990 to 460,000. 2015 in Benxi, um, a Liaoning city of one and a half million in which state and collective heavy industry was the mainstay of the economy. 98% of jobs in the heavy industry sector were lost between 1993 and 2002, and unemployment has run to a staggering 70%. Unemployed workers in Benxi and places like it huddle in um, decrepit factory apartment blocks, often without heat, electricity, or even <coughs> adequate food, pensions that these state industry workers were promised during their Maoist heyday have often gone unpaid. Uh, Four million retirees' benefits were in arrears in 2000, and uh, in 2000, <coughs> 2002, um, there were uh, strikes. Well, there weren't strikes because these were retired workers, but they were massive protests by workers over unpaid pensions, uh, which not only threatened, but did begin to turn into a protest wave. We know the Chinese uh, party state is, uh, has figured out a very ingenious um, and wise strategy of dealing with protests, and they know how to uh, keep their finger in the dike of protests all over the country, and uh, through some combination of carrot and stick, quiet protesting workers down. But what they fear the most, of course, is a protest wave, which actually began to develop um, up in the in the early 2000s. Um, uh, pensions. And finally got put down. Uh, nobody's quite sure exactly how this party pulled it off, but um, what they did. Anyway, employment security has declined for all categories of workers, <coughs> not uh, both um, Lumiyahuko and Feynman. Uh, although some have been affected more severely than others, tens of millions of urban resident workers in state and collective factories uh, have seen their jobs disappear. Unemployment is also very unevenly distributed with peaks in the rust belts of Manchuria and in poorer inland provinces dominated by now shuttered uh, third front factories. For example, in 2015, even the official unemployment rate in Heilongjiang was 40% above the national average. In 2007 and 2008, for the first time, large numbers of rural migrants were also laid off. Um, and of course, rural migrants make up the bulk of China's working class now. But for the first time, there were massive layoffs of them about 10 years ago. Um, uh, while starting in the early 1990s, jobs for rural migrants were generally pretty plentiful, especially in the construction and export sectors. The 2008 Depression saw over 20, 20 million lose their positions. Unlike the urban resident workers, they were not entitled to any benefits whatsoever, of course. Most went home to their villages, uh, although many soon returned when the labor market came up again a couple of years later. China's laid-off workers face three broad alternatives, private sector employment, uh, self-employment, or long-term unemployment.
<clears throat> laid off state and collective industry workers often lack, so this is the um, Fainum Young, uh, the older workers who worked in Chinese factories in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Those people often lack the skills, inclinations, and demographics to land work in the private sector, where youth education, assiduity, high levels of energy, uh, and expectations not tainted by state socialist employment um, are highly prized. Uh, those <coughs> are the workers who work in the, uh, in the state's factories in the Maoist period because they think they're lazy and don't have work to um, <coughs> Self-employment can include everything from starting a business to driving a cab to pedaling along the side of the road. The opportunities for even this sort of petty entrepreneurship depend, of course, on the state of the local economy, the availability of startup capital, good information, and business acumen, all of which rarely come together uh, for a particular worker. Um, for most unemployed workers, 85% uh, in one survey, there has been little way out, and they are forced into very early retirement on meager and rapidly shrinking, quote, benefits, that nobody has written about the quotation marks to put around benefits, more or better than Dory. And so they're forced into relying on uh, meager and rapidly shrinking benefits and humiliating dependence on their children. Urban resident workers in state and collective enterprises who have dodged the bullet uh, live in constant fear of further cutbacks, especially if they work in <coughs> factories in economic difficulty. Um, so workers who manage to keep their jobs actually report that this anxiety about the they might lose their jobs, uh, provides an incentive to work as hard as possible. Uh, it's a great strategy for, uh, for uh, their employers. In such firms, workers have often expressed the hope that a foreign investor will come along, even though they're also well aware that in private firms, uh, if a foreign investor does come along, uh, with their generally more intensive labor processes and draconian management, there's a higher risk of being fired, quote, for cause, even in the absence of workforce retrenchment. Um, some workers are even willing to countenance corruption if the management is doing it to help lure an investor. One worker who I interviewed uh, compared the loyalty to and identification that workers feel with their firms at present with those same feelings back in the Maoist period. Um, he said to me, People have feelings for their firms today because they cherish the opportunity to work. The workers have a sense of crisis, wage gone. They are concerned that if the factory runs into trouble, that it will affect them. Uh, so desperate workers in troubled firms that in some cases, so, so desperate, sorry, so desperate are workers in troubled firms that in some cases they have paid more than a year's wages to employers in bribes and fees to keep their jobs. Um, benefits. Um, state and collective firms no longer offer um, urban resident workers, the uh, welfare benefits that they once did, and private employers certainly don't. Um, Health care and education are now provided on a fee basis, as we all know, and the charges can be significant. Many workers are no longer getting necessary medical help because they can't afford it, and many others are bankrupted when they are forced by serious injury or illness to seek care they can't afford. Uh, Factory-provided housing has been a significant benefit um, since the beginning, since the 30s, um, to state sector workers, despite both marketization and deterioration of old factory and department costs. In 1988, 80% of urban housing costs were paid by public subsidies. 80% of urban housing costs <coughs> were paid by public subsidy. And even in 1995, it still came to 41%. Um, as early as 1979, urban resident workers began to be allowed to purchase their apartments at highly subsidized prices, but the policy was not the political success that it was in Margaret Thatcher's Britain. Sales could sometimes not be completed because firms failed to ante up their required share of housing provident funds that were used to supply mortgages. Workers were often forced to, per often forced to purchase their flats, and many found that a bad deal. Um, how much time have I got left? Half hour. 
five. I'm gonna make it. Um, <coughs> yeah. I'm gonna make it. Um, yeah. One worker uh, said to me, um, "Some workers pine away for the old socialist days when everyone had housing. This is especially the case for those who don't have housing today, such as those who want to marry but can't because they have no." For a couple to live. So housing is actually a kind of a bright spot, um, even if it's deteriorated. For rural migrant workers, of course, housing is a different matter altogether. They live in crowded factory-provided dormitories and eat in factory canteens run by their employers, who are also their landlords, uh, a new example of what Lenin once called skinning the ox twice. Um, their living costs can consume most of their wages. Uh, nevertheless, whether owned or rented and whether rent is paid or not, the fact that almost all workers in China, including the unemployed, have had and continue to have a place to live actually is very significant. Uh, Ching Guan Li has pointed this out, um, arguing that, uh, reminding us that there's little or no homelessness in the Chinese working even among the most <coughs> destitute. The, ex the exception might be construction workers who come to the city and live in the open uh, on the construction site. Um, an apartment, no matter how dismal or remote, is a social and economic lifeline for many workers, and that continues, um, even though many are pretty decrepit. Um, rural migrants, of course, are not entitled to any services or remaining benefits still provided to some urban workers. They have to pay 100% of their All right, conclusion. Um, this together. Workers, cons Chinese workers, compensation and material life under the structural reform pre present a mixed picture. Um, I've given you a lot of gory stuff that emphasizes the negative. Um, but um, <coughs> while resident, urban resident, Feinu Yahuko workers, who have held on to factory employment have seen significant although now declining increases in real wages. Uh, many of them have also lost their jobs altogether and have been unable to find re-employment, and even the unemployed have lost economic and job security to which they had become accustomed in the States. We know this, we all know this. Um, so I don't know why I bothered to say it. Um, urban resident workers have come to experience, have now begun to come to experience similar levels of employment insecurity as rural migrants. Right? They can also be laid off and are getting laid off, and this is very significant. Um, the latter, um, rural migrant workers have toiled for very low wages that are an improvement for them only in comparison with the prospect of little or no income at all in their home villages. Both urban and rural migrant workers receive little or no benefits and they remain housed in qualitatively different but similarly squalid um, quarters. Percentage of strikes and protests in, in this, this is interesting, I just did work this up the other day. The percentage of strikes and protests in state-owned <coughs> enterprises has risen from 4% of the total number of strikes and protests in 2014. So in 2014, all the strikes and protests um, by workers in China, only 4% occurred in state-owned enterprises. But that had rose to 12% in 2018, which suggests to me that the conditions for urban resident workers are deteriorating to levels closer to those uh, in private firms employing rural migrants. Um, finally, of course, workers' incomes and livelihoods are sure to deteriorate further as uh, the economy Moreover, while urban, by, while Feinung Yahuko and Nung Yahuko uh, workers are divided by the household registration system <coughs> and the institutional and political framework and legal frameworks that have grown up around it since the 50s, in material terms, the differences between these two categories of workers are clearly shrinking. Uh, Kevin Lin has argued that, quote, the distinction between migrant workers in the export sector and many workers in the state sector is less dichotomous than it appears, unquote. Many scholars and advocates for the plight of rural migrants 
have argued for the abolition of the Hukko system, seeing it as the institutional and political basis for rural workers' subordination within the working class, but something very different and quieter. Uh, quieter change has actually pushed in the opposite direction. China's structural reform is beginning to reshape the working class itself by flattening the distinction between urban and urban resident and rural migrant workers. Instead of the latter, <coughs> rural migrant workers, rising to the level of the former, if, the, if, the, if Foucault were abolished, <coughs> the very opposite is starting to occur. Structural reform has begun to produce a race to the bottom that portends the homogenization of the Chinese working class, which is a very potentially profound development in the reformation of the working class that could carry with it profound political implications. Um, although that's a, there's a lot of political steps in between those two things. Thank you for listening. To that. that was great, Mark. Can't help but sit here and think, what would Mao say? <laughs> um, <laughs> for maybe more grist for the mill of discussion what later. What would he do? Yeah, what, what would he do? <laughs> Um, but uh, maybe we can move to uh, Huayin. And um, I didn't say this before, but all presenters and all panels are having about 20 minutes, uh, so you can calibrate appropriately so we have a good time for question and answer from our uh, robust audience. Okay, okay, so I have to go to the computer. This doesn't work. Here's the. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, it works. So I'm going to talk about how China's economic reform started. And to address this issue, we have to look at China's economic situations in those years right before the inception of the reform in the late 1970s and the early 1980s. Uh, and in the past few years, I did some field work in China working with my colleagues at different universities, and we interviewed lots of villagers and workers. So basically, our field work uh, was broken into two sets. One is to interview villagers <coughs> of old age to see how they experienced uh, everyday life under the collective system in agriculture. And the other is to interview retired workers to see how they experienced uh, their factory life. And so my presentation today is based on those uh, projects. And I'd like to begin with some of the myths that have prevailed in our understanding of the origins of economic reforms in the early 1980s. One of the myths had to do with the situation in agricultural production in the Mao era, especially in the 1970s. Uh, I guess most of us who try to figure out you know, how the introduction of household responsibility system in agriculture would trace to the stories originating from Xiaogang village. And that's supposed to be representative of the overall situation in rural China. Uh, according to that story, production under the collective system was extremely inefficient. And it's inefficient because of several factors. First of all, farmers had no right <coughs> to exit the collective system. And because they had no freedom to exit the production teams, that there, there was no mechanism to constrain the problem of shirking or slacking in everyday production. And second, there was huge difficulties to supervise team members in their everyday production. And further, the labor reward system was highly egalitarian. No matter how you work, uh, 
you most farmers receive the same rates of work point. So farmers have no incentive to work harder than anybody else. So agricultural productivity was at a very low level. And that uh, offers a strong reason for farmers to think otherwise and shogun villagers you know, decide to uh, break up the uh, production team and relocate the collective farmland to individual households. So that's how economic reform started uh, from the grassroots level. <coughs> and uh, my own thoughts on the origins of the economic reform in agriculture would be sort of different from the conventional wisdom. In my uh, analysis of the findings from field work, I try to identify three sets of factors. Three sets of factors. The first is the formal <coughs> visible institutions, which are uniform throughout global China, regardless of where the collectives are, the basic formal systems are the same in, in different parts of China. And these include the basic accounting units, the, the percentage of agricultural output to be extracted by the state, the different forms of <coughs> work point systems. You know, farmers were rewarded with a number of work points, but there are different rates or different methods to uh, decide you know, how many points a worker received per day. And the ratio between ration grain and work point grain in income distribution, and access to modern agricultural uh, inputs, availability of opportunities to earn income outside the collective. So lots of factors which are formal and universal throughout China that shape the basic framework of the collective system. And the second set of factors are those informal hidden uh, institutions that are unique to every production team, to every locality. And these factors include, for example, the indigenous social networks, kinship ties, communal norms, collective sessions, family practice, gender roles, and so on. And the third set of factors are those that's non-institutional, non-institutional, including local geographical and ecological conditions, and especially the fertility of farmland, cropping patterns of a given area, availability of natural resources, ratio of population to arable land, and so on. So we have three sets of factors. The formal visible factor that's imposed top down by the state, and then the informal invisible factors embedded in every community, and then the non institutional factors uh, that vary from region to region, different parts of China. So, how do farmers perform in every production? Uh, my conclusion is that that depends on how those three factors three sets of factors interact with each other. And there is a wide, array, a wide array of possibilities. We can conceive two extremes. At one end, farmers could be uh, extremely hardworking, and productivity was at a very high level. And that's where the vintage was well endowed. Man was highly fertile. And the work point system offers strong incentive for farmers to work hard. And the state's extraction of resources from the production team was kept at a low level. So all those formal, informal factors, as well as non institutional factors, <coughs> combined to offer an optimal situation where farmers had good reason to work hard for the production team. And then at the other end, we find in another extreme case, where farmers lost incentive to work at all, and the productivity was very low. And that's where the vintage was poorly endowed. Man was you know, infertile. Uh, the work point systems were very egalitarian. 
and uh, the states extract most of the output from the village. So you will find you know, all those conditions were against uh, farmers incentivized <coughs> input of, uh, of land. And then between the two extremes, there could be lots of possibilities, lots of possibilities. And my field work convinced me that in certain parts of China, especially in the Yangtze Delta in the early 1980s, we will find a situation that's close to the positive side, where farmers had you know, a strong incentive to work hard. And then, in, in many other places, you know, farmers were confronted with uh, adverse, uh, with uh, uh, you know, uh, situations that's against their uh, heart and work. So, lots of possibilities, and th this is uh, one of my findings from the field work. And the second question that I try to solve in my research is about the origins of economic reforms in state-owned enterprises. And here again, we have some stereotypes that have shaped our understanding on this issue. I guess you know, most economists who did research uh, on China's state-owned enterprises in the late 70s and 1980s came to the conclusion that those SOEs were very inefficient. And then they were inefficient uh, primarily because the labor management system was problematic. Uh, workers received the same pay uh, or the same wage rate, and then they saw no changes in their wage rate for, the, for years. So they lost incentive to work hard for the factories. <coughs> and behind this conclusion was assumption that the workers are ultimately uh, the selfish individuals. They were concerned with the maximization of their self-interest. And their labor <coughs> input is directly linked with the labor <coughs> remuneration system. But again, you know, from our interviews with uh, the dozens of retired workers, I guess we, we have we re, we re interviewed uh, 97 retirees at different cities who have been employees in factories of different uh, sections. Uh, here again, to make sense of workers' performance in everyday production in the state-owned enterprises. I try to uh, distinguish again between different sets of factors. Uh, one is the formal institutions in microeconomic organizations, uh, which are multiple and changing over time during the Mao era. And these include labor payments and policies, compositions and social statuses of workers. Uh, recognitions on everyday work performance and political organizations and activities. And again, all these institutions are imposed top down. And they are universal or uniform throughout uh, the hundreds of thousands of SOEs in different parts of China. And the second set of factors are those that are hidden, invisible, and found in different workplaces. And they vary you know, from a factory to factory. And these are about the workers' identities, group cohesion, everyday work norms, collective sanctioning against deviations, and so on. So to understand how and why workers you know, perform differently in different factories, we have to put them into a historical context and offer a big description of the environment where they're working. And in that context, or the thick description should take into account both the formal, top-down, externally imposed institutions as well as the hidden, 
local embedded practices, norms, uh, identities, and so on. And then we, may, we will find that workers' uh, you know, behavior in the workplace will complex, and they vary uh, from place to place, you know, from year to year, depending on how this uh, external or internal institutions <coughs> combine to incentivize and to constrain their everyday performance. And you know, in our interviews with those 97 workers, one surprising finding is that most of them will tell us a story about how they have you know, worked so hard uh, in those years. In the back in the 70s or in, even earlier in the 60s. And they ex explain their hard work by saying that people at that time appear to be very simple, naive, and pure. You know, that, that's you know, that's you know, what uh, they said in their original words. Uh, but you know, my interpretation was that it's not really the result of being simple, being pure, being loyal. There are some more complex reasons, and it is you know my uh, conclusion is that it is the interaction of the formal and the informal factors that combine to produce an equilibrium, an equilibrium uh, that prevailed in the years before the reform that can offer a strong constraint against shirking and slacking <coughs> everyday factor production. But that equilibrium was destroyed or damaged because of changes in the economic situation in the 1980s. And that gave rise to most of the problems with labor management. Shirking and slacking became a widespread problem not in the mild years, but in the, in the early years of reform, especially in the 1980s. And then, the third myth I try to uh, debunk or uh, to address in a very different way is about, well, that's you know, what my, uh, my topic is supposed to be, about you know, the origins of economic reforms, or how China's economic reform started. A common sense, or a widely accepted uh, consensus is that the reform leaders had no roadmap at the beginning of the reform. And so their approach uh, is that of you know, using a Chinese phrase, crossing the rivers by groving stone <laughs> Under feet, they had no idea what's going on. You know what, what's what, what's confront them. You know how to implement the reform step by step. They had no ideas. You know about uh, you know what what they would uh, practice in the years to come. So it's highly experimental. And some researchers de describe that process as spontaneous, bottom up, uncharted, and so on. Uh, and we can use lots of evidence to support that assumption, such as the stories from the Shogun village, such as the rise of the rural uh, industries, or the TVEs, township and village enterprises. And I guess you know, much of this interpretation, was, uh, this interpretation was true, but that's not complete. And that does not reflect uh, much of the realities of economic situation uh, in, in those years. So my answer to uh, the question whether or not uh, China's economic reforms was spontaneous, bottom up, uncharted, or it's a process of crossing the river by feeding the rocks uh, under feet, was that this depiction is partly true, and it's true only uh, uh, tactically. Uh, it's only when the reform leaders were trying or exper experimenting specific methods such as improving productivity by reorganizing uh, labor uh, management systems or by introducing some incentives in factory uh, production 
they have good ideas yeah. what's, about what's the most effective methods. So they try different forms of uh, systems or organizations. But if we look at the large picture, if we look at the strategies of the uh, reformers, I would say they were very clear and they were very consistent about the goals of reforms. In agriculture, uh, the collective ownership of farmland was never in the change, and that's still insisted uh, to this day. In industry, the importance of state-owned enterprises are still emphasized, and the state would never give up its control of those uh, state-owned enterprises in the key sectors of the economy. However, uh, throughout the you know, reforms, you will find a contradiction between the imposed reforms from above, especially the state's insistence on the socialist nature of Chinese economy, and uh, the emergence of a market economy and the uh, booming of non-state sectors. And uh, that confrontation gave rise to lots of ironies and paradoxes in Chinese economic lives. That's still challenging the Chinese state uh, to this day. That's what I have found uh, in my research. Uh, thanks. That's a great point, and, and I think that's actually a great way to begin because uh, during lunch I'll be presenting on my book, Red China's Green Revolution, and, and my findings are almost <coughs> completely, I would say they are completely in line with uh, Hua Yin's findings, which are at a lower level, at the village level, at the individual level, but um, I would, I, I really agree with a lot that you said, and I think there's one point to put out there. The idea of the lazy rural worker, that peasants were just hanging out, sitting there, in the, in, in, in the rice paddy. I, I think that is the biggest, I mean, in my own research, I found that to be false as well. And I think that there's been millions, tens of millions of people have been disparaged by this idea that they just whiled away the days sitting there uh, under the sunshine, when in reality, they were working very hard for not enough money, as Mark's presentation, especially in the factory suggests. So I just wanna put my finger on that one issue because it's such a, 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 um, a contrary, you to the one that's often put out there, uh, especially the one that I learned in, in many Western contexts. So, thanks so much. So, uh, uh, batting cleanup, uh, Professor Solinger. Okay. Uh, well, I don't really mean to be uh, trying to sell my book, but <laughs> it's very relevant. This is an edited book that came out very recently, a couple months ago, Polarized Cities. Portraits of Rich and Poor in Urban China. It's a study of uh, six different cases of how groups of very poor people live in the cities and very rich people. So in the introduction, I go into some <coughs> depth about how this polarization took place. And since this is a meeting looking back at what has taken place in China over the 40 years, what I'm going to present has to do with, in terms of people's styles of life and livelihood, the huge amount of inequality that has occurred. So uh, I think I'd better either go over there or turn around. I think I'll go over there. So, I should take that with me, I guess. <laughs> 
categories of his thought. First of all, opposed to capitalism. This included hating any kind of bureaucracy, routine, or the status quo, which usually backs up a capitalist system, and any form of materialism, whether it was markets, or prices, or profits, all these things that are listed here are components of a capitalist system that Mao objected to. Relatedly, he promoted egalitarianism, at least for the population, not for himself or his family or his fellow leaders, but among the people. And this was marked by slogans, including serve the people, the mass line, which means policies decided at the top levels of leadership were taken down to the level of the people where they lived and worked. Feedback was obtained and then that feedback was taken back up to the leadership level to be incorporated into final policy. And anti-individualism, people should have in his day been selfless and focused on serving the collective, the collective unit, whether it was their commune in the countryside or their factory in the cities, and in a larger sense, the country as a whole. And policy was supposed to be carried out through mass campaigns. Everybody in China knew when a campaign was going on each person was supposed to devote attention, focus their activities on fulfilling the goal of the campaign. And one of the targets, one of the chief targets, was divisions among the population against distinctions by wealth. Constant class struggle to make, to simplify the whole long years of struggle. Initially, at least, it was struggle against the people who had more wealth and the effort to achieve a more equal society. So the targets were the wealthier and the better off. And even after the basic distinctions were eliminated, Mao was always suspicious that they could come back or were in the midst of coming back. So even into the 1960s, which was getting to be two decades after the Communist Party had taken over. He continued to worry that class divisions could be coming back and to demand that the people struggle against that. People here in the room have probably heard of the Cultural Revolution, which began in 1966. The core of it was three years till 69, but the ideology that promoted it and the divisions among the people, the uh, people still believing that capitalists were uh, at work in society, those thoughts and, and struggles continued till Mao died in 1976. So, even though there were changes in the 1970s, this ideology and struggle atmosphere continued for 10 years. It was a humiliating time for people thought to be living out capitalist principles. So here's uh, a picture of what happened to people who are part of one thing that happened to people who were suspected of capitalism, they'd be paraded through the streets, and I think this man's hair is being pulled back, or something's going on at the level of his head, um, with masses of people around. So being a capitalist was uh, to be the enemy. But after Mao died, there was a brand new economic ideology which turned Mao's thinking on its head. 
this slogan, Observe Economic Laws, first appeared in the People's <coughs> Daily, the uh, party's newspaper, in July of 1978. But uh, at the time, I was reading the People's Daily every day, and I noticed it didn't, the slogan didn't surface again for another three months, which usually indicates there's some debate going on or some opposition. Observe economic laws was something that Mao had no concern with, but it was a, a precursor or a signal that something was changing, that market economics was going to be an important component of a whole new framework and program. Economic matters gradually became dominant, which meant that the laws of supply and demand would govern what people did in the workplace and what people did in the marketplace. It was no longer a case of opposing prices. Instead, prices determined what was purchased and that the supply was also determined by what people were buying. There were advertisements. There was open competition. Also, financial power was given to local levels so that people at the local levels would receive incentives to produce more and eventually produce better quality output. The central government permitted and encouraged areas with a better geographical location, more natural resources, better climate, and also situated along the coast where it was, number one, convenient to export, number two, where overseas Chinese had initially lived. Those richer areas had all these natural advantages to begin with, and on top of that, the government gave those places priorities in terms of government loans and um, taxation and land to push ahead best. So, and just um, took a little bit of time for this new way of thinking to take hold. So I remember I was at Stanford in 1981, and a scholar from China came to give a talk. And even as these richer areas were beginning to jump ahead of the rest of the country, this scholar said, he was from Shanghai, and he said, we can't do better than other places if there's poverty in the far west, we have to equalize and distribute out there and take care of that area. So it was all very gradual, not sudden. But meanwhile, the richer areas, people with connections, the people with more skills, were gradually becoming favored in policy and becoming wealthier. So special privileges for coastal zones in the east. The philosophy was <coughs> Deng Xiaoping, who had risen to leadership after 1977. And, uh, all these things are highlights in my own life. I still remember sitting on the steps of uh, the library at Stanford and seeing that Deng Xiaoping had reemerged as a top leader in the summer of 1977. Um, he popularized the slogan that it would be okay for some people to get rich first. <coughs> the idea supposedly was that the wealth would gradually be trickled down and shared and everybody would be boosted, which isn't really what happened. Another saying that was popular was, and I think probably began with done, to get rich is glorious. And people who had become wealthy were supposed to be admired and ideally 
copied. So gradually with these slogans, this new philosophy, the advantages for people who were wealthier, income gaps developed. Furthermore, corruption, which had been not non-existent, it did exist in the time of Mao, but during Mao's day, it, it, corruption was on a very low scale, and it had to do with people with access to some goods, being able to trade that off for power, but it was on a small scale. Uh, that became more and more open, and larger and larger sums were involved. Princelings were the children of officials. They especially had access to power and resources and could cut deals with people going into business, trading wealth for power. So by the late 80s, there was clearly a coalition formed between people going into business and people with power. So uh, in the early months of 1990, I wrote an essay about this. So it was already fairly well known, well, something obvious that could be seen. And the, uh, whereas in the past there had been attacks on people with greater wealth, physical and verbal, through the 80s and into the 90s, people were jealous of those with wealth and angry about them, but those were the people in power. The market forces became more and more prominent. You could see market competition, the incursion of material incentives, that is, people winning material rewards for doing better in business who had guanxi or personal ties with those with power, people in geographically favored places, and more and more people with education and skills. Mao, with his focus on egalitarianism, had uh, tried to equalize education, spread it into the countryside, have workers, uh, I mean, have people, students, work with workers, you have students go to the countryside, but into the 90s more and more people with better <coughs> educations were getting ahead and there were clear distinctions in terms of education and what it could bring. The economy became more and more open both to private firms, which scarcely existed at all in 1978 when this program of change got started, more and more private sector firms came into being, and more and more foreign investment came into China. At first it was closely checked, limited, in the 1970s, but into the 80s and 90s it got more and more uh, untrammeled and prevalent. People with talent, funds, expertise could excel. <coughs> I'm saying things in different words that I've already said, managerial and technical skills, private connections. So we began to see income changes. The per capita average income rose 30-fold in a period of 40 years. This is the latest statistics I have. Uh, this is the period we're talking about, China's reform and opening 40 years, 30-fold increase <coughs> in average income. But that's average. We often hear that China's become so wealthy. Yes, there are wealthy people, and yes, average incomes have risen a great deal. But that's only part of the story. The average always conceals the extremes. We also hear that uh, 
whereas there were no people with middle class spending power in 1978. One figure, this is a quite variable how we talk about this, but one figure I read recently says 200 million people have middle class spending power today. Uh, out of 1.4 billion, what is that, one seventh? Make sure I'm right. And once I see zeros, I kind of can't quite get my numbers right. So, uh, the, so one seventh, that's about 14% of the population might be middle class. However, uh, there's still poverty. We hear that some hundreds of million people have been lifted out of poverty. I really wonder what that means because I've been studying urban poverty for a long time. I know that this figure is almost entirely, or maybe is entirely, about the countryside. That's one qualification. In the cities, to the contrary, poverty has emerged where it didn't exist before. The second caveat is that I, I'm almost certain that many of these people lifted from poverty have gone from being below the poverty line to being somewhat above it, but not significantly above it. And those people are in danger of slipping back into poverty because there really isn't a way to keep them at that level. They're still in danger of falling into poverty because they are thrown off their land. They may be forced to move into cities where they can't get work. They may become ill and there may not be a way for them to afford the treatment they need. So you have to question this. It, it's so often said that all these people are lifted out of poverty. Well, it's, it's a, I think it's a bit of an illusion. You can see these, these symbols of consumerism. Masses of people, they're not, they can't stay on the sidewalks. There's so many people out shopping. You see colors, advertisements, and crowds, which you didn't see before. People all wore this color, blue or gray. Uh, you didn't see advertisements, you only saw political slogans. So visually there's been a big change. This is a very typical scene of people with cell phones sitting outside a fancy department store. People wearing Western style clothing, looking at their smartphones. But let's look at the inequality that's come about. I wonder, is everybody familiar with the Gini Index of Income Inequality? If it's zero, there's perfect equality. If it's one, there's extreme inequality and that all the wealth is in the hands of our people. There's been this kind of increase of 0.30 in 1980 when China was one of the most equal societies in the world up until uh, recently, 0.55 is one of the most unequal societies. Uh, one figure says, these, these vary, so one figure says 0.73 in 2012. The richest 1% own a third of household wealth. Huge regional gaps, urban rural gaps and also as my other book talks about gaps within the cities urban poverty isn't really people don't know about it but it's there and there's as uh, mark blecker discussed or mentioned unemployment insecurity and the rise of urban poverty 15 years ago there were only three people 
who were billionaires in U.S. dollars. Just eight years <coughs> later, there were 2.7 million people who were U.S. millionaires, according to one source. Now, these, these figures are very variable, but uh, now first I mentioned billionaires, now I'm talking about millionaires. This is quite a jump if all these figures are at all consistent. Three years ago, billionaires held 1.4 trillion U.S. dollars as a group of known net worth. Known because a lot of it's hidden. This equals the gross domestic product of all of Australia. Two years ago, there were 594 known billionaires, according to one source, with 242 added in one year. Another source has a different figure, but still over 300 known billionaires in 2017. <laughs> Those with a net worth of more than 10 million UN increases every month. That's about one and a half million US. The total number is under 0.1% of the population. And here's some scenes of rich Chinese and their lifestyle. The roots of inequality or power combined with Party officials enter business, set up companies with official help, land, loans, raw materials. This uh, alliance I mentioned before, bureaucrats <coughs> and businessmen have shared interests in money and power. Yes, there's a major campaign against corruption, but these kinds of differences persist. With connections and bribes, both businessmen and bureaucrats get wealthy. And this is a very interesting statistic. The net worth of the 70 richest delegates to the National People's Congress, that is China's Congress, had 90 billion US <coughs> dollars in February 2012. More than 10 times the net worth of all these top leaders in the US combined. The effect on the urban workforce, uh, this is uh, forced mass unemployment. 60 to 70 million workers were turned out of their jobs. My reasoning for this is China decided in the late 90s it would definitely enter the World Trade Organization and needed to get rid of factories that were underperforming or that and also the such factories should release all their workforce supposedly to the market but there were jobs for them. Huge increase in urban poverty, probably around eight to ten percent of the urban population. Those people who lost their jobs were not getting reemployed. The rate was less than 19% in 01. I'm sure it's lower now. What these people do is take repeated menial, short-term, irregular work posts <coughs> or um, stay at home. Here's some scenes of the urban poor. Street sweeping is a typical occupation. Mao was so right. Corruption has become rampant. Inequality is extreme. Poverty reemerged in the cities once markets came into prominence. Rich people enjoy great excesses, and selfishness is everywhere. So, and when I give this a lecture with some of this material in class, I have a slide of Mao lying in his mausoleum, and I, I should have added that here, but I didn't, saying, how can he lie so quietly?
Well, we've had three great uh, uh, presentations here um, uh, covering a wide variety. Um, so uh, speaking about the urban, speaking about the rural, and then Mark talking about uh, rural and urban workers and the uh, e equalization. Um, there's one point I just want to raise here, and then I want to go directly to, to, to any questions from the audience. But I just want to say I completely agree with Professor Solinger's point about this idea of have been lifted. Right? It's almost as if a hand came out and took these people and lifted them. Not that they were, as Mark and, 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 and Huayin pointed out, working themselves 10 hours a day to lift themselves. And so having just come back from China, this idea that these people have been lifted rather than lifting themselves, I think is something that's worth mentioning here. So I want to go right to the audience. And what I want to do here, because we're tight on time, is I want to take three questions. Um, and then, you know, if you can, try to direct them at specific people. Um, and then uh, we'll turn to our uh, panelists and allow them to answer the questions. So, uh, hands up. <laughs> Looks like you've solved all the questions. Yeah. Oh, okay, uh, James and then uh, Tom. Um, in honor of this conference, the New York Times has a story this morning um, called Worker at Workers' Activism Rises as China's Economy Slows. Um, and mentions uh, Xi Jinping's efforts to control this. I planted that story. Pardon? <laughs> I planted that story. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the question is, uh, you know, I had read before the students at some of the universities have been quoting old Maoist slogans and trying to um, support workers and have been repressed. So the, my question was, uh, maybe this is to Mark, but really to any of you, how far do you think this will go? Uh, what, what are the chances that there will be a organized, a, a new organized but unofficial uh, worker movement? Okay, uh, Tom, and then hopefully if we have a student in the room, maybe the third. Well, uh, my, my com mine's more of a comment and a, a little bit of discomfort with the character or the, you say, the atmosphere of the session. I mean, I, I'm hearing a sort of sense that poor China can do no right. Uh, on one hand, it's criticized for apparently misrepresenting the period of agricultural collectivization. If the economy, it worked better then. Then you come to Mark and the labor force oppression, which absolutely does go on. It, uh, there's uh, stories that abound of labor rights abuses, back pay, so on. And then you come to Professor Solinger and the poverty and inequality. But you know, when you do development economics, and especially when, when you come to China, when you go, you have to get the control country, the peer group, right. And the comparison for our discussion should be uh, India or Kenya, some large developing country. And how has China done vis-a-vis -vis them? I keep feeling in this discussion that the background control group is ourselves. And I suggest that when you come to China, and do, especially if you're going to talk about the economy, I, I won't uh, cross over into politics and sociology, that cannot be the case. The right control group, uh, we need to park our subjectivity and our prejudices at the door when we come in to discuss it. And by the way, as a, as a throwaway line, we've not been doing so great. Uh, we've had tremendous increases in inequality over the last 30 years. Uh, worker insecurity is terrible in this country. <coughs> Some of the work practices, I mean, they're not, they're not quantitatively the same, but the same fears about job loss are here in the United States. So I think it's the, the discussion needs to be recalibrated. How is China doing vis-a-vis -vis India or Kenya? That would be a good benchmark, and then go from there. Uh, third question, uh, Brantley? Long ago, student. I'm a student of China. Yes, yeah, student. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, I have a big question and a small question. I'll just ask a small question in the interest of time. And that is, uh, I wonder, uh, uh, Huayi, uh, the, the villages that worked well, uh, would be, wouldn't they be pushing up against limits on marketing? Uh, wouldn't, I mean, it would seem to be that, that even though they're they're working well in, internally and their incentives are working well, in dodging the situation, the village is going well. They you know they feel this lid of uh, only two pigs or or can't have you know can't have local markets, and they would then with the capital and their organization etc. be 
best able to expand into township and village enterprises, et cetera, and thereby increase inequality during the reform. Okay, so uh, my thinking is uh, we can take about seven minutes total, uh, seven or eight minutes, and then we can move more quickly than the 10 minutes allotted to the next panel. So um, after we wrap up here at about 25 after, let's try to move pretty quickly to, so we can stay on time. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it to you guys to fight over who uh, speaks first. Uh, I'll say one thing. I don't think the idea was to make any comparisons with the U.S. My comparison implicit was with the widespread story that China's wealthy and that the standard of living is really high there now. I think a lot of the news coverage would lead people to think that everybody in China is doing very well. And I was countering that, not criticizing China for doing poorly, just demonstrating that it's not totally doing as well as we often hear. Okay, uh, may I ask uh, Dr. Wolf's question? I guess you know, my answer to your question is, uh, the best way to answer that is to refer to George's book that explains <laughs> Definitely the, uh, uh, the power struggle between yeah. the loyalist faction and the reform faction uh, right after the death of Mao as a, as a leading reason uh, behind the introduction of agricultural reforms. Uh, and my personal Observation, as well as you know, uh, walking in the documents of animal to ask, uh, could docu uh, could you, uh, testify to was that in the late 1970s, agricultural productivity was improving throughout China because of the introduction of some new incentives. Farmers had a stronger reason to work harder than before, and that their living conditions were improving uh, very fast. And then there was a debate whether or not. Uh, you know, the Chinese government should push the collective system to an even higher level you know, by redefining the ba basic accounting unit from the production team to, to you know, the brigade. You know, and that's even bigger than a team. So, you know, I, I saw no reason, I guess you know, that's what you know, George had you know, argued. There was no sign that the collective system would, you know, be verging on a you know, collapse. Uh, and the real reason why the collapse system was uh, dismantled and then the farmland was redistributed almost overnight was because of the efforts from higher up. Uh, so <laughs> that's you know, oh, my you know, understanding uh, and you know, what we have shared in common. The only thing I would add to that quickly is that in all of my interviews, I never met somebody who anticipated decollectivization in their area until they were instructed to decollectivize. Um, there wasn't somebody who said, well, we, 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 we kind of did this quietly. The, the Shaogang story, not only are there major problems with it, we could get into later, but, I'll, but, I, but I agree with Hua Yin that in, in my experiences, people have always said it came from above. Specifically, they said it came from the province, uh, but I don't know if that was just in Hunan where I was getting that information or all around China. But yeah, and Mark, do you want to take uh, James's uh, question? And Tom's too. Oh yeah, of course. Good to see you again, Tom. Um, um, you're completely right. Um, I teach an India-China comparison. These are problems of a uh, of an economic rocket ship, which India doesn't have. Um, if we want to get normative which I think we probably do at our peril, uh, but if we want to, um, we could say that, I mean, I'm stunned, actually, that it's been China and not India that has been the rocket ship. And if you think about it, India, it has English, it has, you know, it had a highly trained um, phalanx of uh, government bureaucrats, Democracy. Well, democracy may be part of where it's going. Well, part of the problem, but of, uh, uh, technical people and government people, private sector. Um, the reason China 
my students will tell you the reason that it was China, not India, has everything to do with extraordinarily high levels of state capacity in China, both in the Mao period. I mean, I'm a big follower of um, Amartya Sen and uh, Jean Breze's argument that the best, best way to get the biggest bang for your development investment buck is educating girls. That's their historic. If you want to develop, educate girls, even if you're not a feminist, just interested in development. And that was done in the <coughs> And it, it's a tradition that continued. Uh, institution, which is a tradition that continued. Uh, who makes these you know, sweatshops? It's educated young women. India, young girls from the countryside can't get to the city. So state capacity. So if you want to get more of it, you could say, well, given this tremendous state capacity, and it's getting stronger, at least in the short run, there seems to be, um, one might hope that the Chinese state would use this capacity to address some of the problems that we are talking about. Um, <clears throat> so yes, these are the problems of our rapid, too rapidly maturing, overheated technology. Right? Um, Jim's uh, question on, on uh, yeah, uh, quickly, uh, because of this tremendous capacity the Chinese state has developed, I, I alluded to this quickly, you know, there's protests, there's labor protests and strikes every single day in all big cities all over China, and the government has developed this extraordinary capacity to stick its finger in all these dikes and to keep this under control various ways that take too long to, to go through uh, by fragmenting, like doing carrot and stick and all this. And there's no reason to think that will continue to work. Um, and that they'll keep doing this capacity. If there's some, if a wave of protests that would really be threatening and would bring about a Chinese version of an Arab Spring, a kind of spontaneous uh, um, linking up of it, it's usually due to, um, I mean, in Egypt, what we forget was, we really started it, just like the French Revolution, was a big spike in food prices, right? And China can prevent this from happening because of all this tremendous growth. So I think that's probably not going to happen. Um, um, it might erupt, and, but I think they'll be able to figure it out. Um, I've urged them, though, to take, a, again, a more this will sound more normative than it, I really mean it in a kind of descriptive way, mature approach to labor relations, mature in the sense of kind of historically developing. Um, I went to a conference a few years ago with a bunch of upper middle level uh, officials in Tianjin, and I gave a talk in which I said, you should legalize the right to strike. And they were horrified. Legalize the right to strike, and I said, "Look, you've got the strikes; they're happening every day anyway. If you legalize them, take a look at the Wagner Act." And I gave a talk about the Wagner Act. If you legalize the right to strike, you can regulate strikes. You can guanli strikes. Well, then they got interested. <laughs> of course, you know we can regulate strikes, but that's exactly what a mature economy does, and it's, it's what they. I, I urge them to consider this. Uh, as a way of dealing with this in the long run. This, this crazy system they have where the workers are on strike all the time and it's illegal. But they, uh, I said it couldn't go on, but it's been going on for 25 years. Maybe it can go on indefinitely. Uh, anyway, those are the quick responses. Great. So maybe uh, we can join together <coughs> thanking the panel. And before we do, the other panel.